Hello and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm John Kampfner, the director of the UK in the World project. I'll be sitting in for Bronwyn with a packed show for you this week. We'll firstly be looking at Joe Biden's 2023 State of the Union. This week saw the US president address an unruly joint session of Congress, during which he discussed, among other things, America's place in the world, China, Ukraine, and of course, the state of the economy. As we enter the start of a new electoral cycle and the midpoint of the Biden presidency, we look back at how he's been doing and what the challenges are that lie ahead of him. We'll also be discussing the AUKUS alliance. 18 months from the announcement that the UK and the US would help Australia develop nuclear hunter-killer submarines to the chagrin of the French, we're expecting to hear next month about how the subs will actually be built, and importantly for Australia, by whom. What does AUKUS mean for Australia, for non-proliferation and the Indo-Pacific more broadly? Finally, we'll also discuss the topic everyone on Twitter suddenly became an expert on this week, China's spy balloon over Montana. Was it a signal from Beijing and what was it trying to photograph? Fortunately, we have experts in situ to tell you why you shouldn't worry, or perhaps why you should. Joining me down the line from Singapore is Ewan Graham, the Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Defence and Strategy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Welcome to the show, Ewan. Thanks very much, John. Nice to be with you. And here in the studio in London are my colleagues, Leslie Vinjamuri, not in the host chair this week. I nabbed that one, but as director of our Americas programme. Good to see you, John. And Patricia Lewis, fresh from our event with the head of the IAEA, and Director of our International Security Programme. Hi there, Patricia. Hi, John. Great to be here. Let's start first with that, how can you call it, lively State of the Union address. Joe Biden heckled by Republicans and in many cases answering straight back at them. Leslie, it was a pretty extraordinary moment the, in the context even of American politics of recent years, though to a Brit perhaps we do theatre, so it was fairly familiar territory. Take us through the address that night. What does it tell us about the state of America as it enters 2023? Well, President Biden gave an address that was, I'd say, 98% focused on the US domestic scene. What was perhaps most surprising for those of us watching from abroad was how little was said about the rest of the world. It was implicit. If you listen to the president talk about his bipartisan successes on putting money into climate, into the production of semiconductor chips, into manufacturing, into job creation, so much of what he was signaling, you know, had at the back of his mind quietly competition with China, the need to really shore up the U.S. economy. But there wasn't a word said about China for a very long time. This is a president who's looking ahead. He's looking likely to announce his candidacy very soon. He's focused on a country that has been phenomenally divided and at a party that he leads that has lost traction with what was, you know, for a very long time at the center of its base, which is white working class Americans. So much of what he was saying was really uh, focused at that demographic. He talked about building factories where you wouldn't need a college education and those not being only on the coasts. And But at the same time, of course, he was you know, balancing the progressive wing of his party, talking about the need for diversity, uh, talking about the brutal murder of Tyre Nichols, whose, whose parents were, were in the audience. So it was a really uh, masterful speech. He also had, as, as you rightly noted, the hecklers from the uh, Freedom Caucus, from the, the far right of the Republican Party. It was very much like watching a session of Parliament. So it felt very normal to all of us over here, but it was really quite remarkable by American standards. But this is a president who dived in. He tackled it. He he said to them, you know, you've said Social Security and Medicare are are on the chopping block as we approach this you know, looming concern of, of debt. They said, no, we're not. And he said, great. So we're agreed. So, you know, this is, this is a man who uh, didn't shy in the face of the hecklers. He really engaged with it. And he sort of went in to be as energetic as he could, because as we know, the big critique of, of his potential a run for presidency is, is his age. I mean, that's the point. I mean, he may have said little about the world, but for the world, the state of Biden and the state of American pol- politics really matters. 
So how did he, do you feel, beyond the chamber? How did he go down? And what does it tell us about the state of Biden and his prospects for 2024? I, you know, if you if you listen to the commentators that you and I and Patricia and others do, they thought it was a, in other words, uh, those who were sort of professional and in the industry. The Beltway. Uh, yes, they tended to think it was a very, very good speech, that he had tremendous energy, that he was focused, that he hit all the talking points. But of course, this is an America that's very divided. And, you know, the person who uh, responded to him, the youngest governor in the United States, Sarah Huckabee, governor of Arkansas, told a very different story. And and many people listen to that story. They see this as a president who underinflated the threat that China presents, took too long, you know, days after a balloon crosses the, the U.S. homeland, took far too long to talk about it, said too little, that told a, a story that doesn't cohere with their understanding of their daily reality about inflation, about the current state of the economy. So, it, you know, on the one hand, it was a very powerful and masterful speech, but that doesn't mean that's how it was read across the United States. And you, and you were listening or watching the speech in Asia. How do you feel it went down there in that region? And, and more generally, how do people in Asia not just opinion formers, but governments, do you think assess the Bi- the prospects for Biden in 2024? And how did that speech make a difference? Well, there's there's no singular view in, in Asia. Uh, opinion varies. Uh, you have China on the one hand, uh, you have the skeptical in the middle and the allies on, on the other end of the spectrum. So it's a hard audience to, to pitch to. Uh, but I think the the, the eloquent, the, the the balloon spoke for President Biden in a way that he didn't have to uh, mention China. I, I think that it, 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 in that sense, it's an unwanted gift uh, that it was front and center uh, of the U.S. media space in, in, in the way that it was. I don't think all of Asia welcomes that. Uh, I think some people here believe that there was an overreaction from the U.S., on the other hand, others will be very glad to see China sort of back front and center uh, with the anxiety that Ukraine has drained away the, the scarce foreign policy attention span that the White House has. And in more generally, what do you, therefore yourself, how do you gauge his, his prospects and how that would affect the strength of the second half of the first Biden presidency uh, how that affects Indo- the Indo-Pacific and all the challenges, the China challenges? Well, I think there's a sense that you know, there is consistency back in the U.S. position in a way that there hasn't been for, for a number of years. I think that we're still in the rebound from the, the Trump administration and the Biden administration has generally said the right things about alliances. This is a, a very needy region that needs a lot of reassurance. So I think that... Uh, uh, that's there. But on the other hand, political doubts about the credibility of the United States as a, as a long-term guarantor aren't going to go away. And Ukraine has also fed those. Patricia, second half of presidencies with congressional deadlock, gridlock, or at least difficulties usually lead presidents to devote more time to international affairs. What's your assessment, particularly on the issues around security that that you focus on? And do you think there's going to be any movement on issues such as JCPOA? Or where would you predict the next two years of Biden's focus to be? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think that, you know, Ewan's absolutely right that Biden administration has helped really right the boat because there was so much turbulence during the Trump administration, particularly among allies and the concerns that uh, Trump, you couldn't, you began to be able to predict where he might land, but it wasn't a good place where he would be predicting where he would land. And so I think Biden has helped reassure allies both in the Asia Pacific and in Europe. And of course, now with the uh, war that Russia is conducting against Ukraine, that has been absolutely fundamental 
but he's coming under a lot of pressure. You've still got a very sort of isolationist part of the of the Republican Party saying, why are we spending all this money on a faraway war? We should be all about competition with China. Uh, we should all be all about, you know, the making sure that we've got enough materials to produce our own semiconductors. We've got to get in there with quantum uh, technologies, which are really leaping ahead. You know, we this is this is a distraction for us, and we we don't want to send all of our money uh, to support uh, this this country in Ukraine. However, I would say that um, a large part of the population in North America, not just in the United States, but also in Canada, of course, really do see that this is an important fight that Russia has invaded illegally. So it's it, this is absolutely fundamental. And I, but I think technology is really going to be at the heart of this. So you know, building the factories, you know, really pushing back. Uh, creating a, a new technological science and technology environment. And we note that a new department's just been set up in the UK on this this week. That's right, so the whole is, reshuffling of the business department. And, exactly, and, and we saw the science. integrated review document before, and we hear it's not going to change in this regard, in that, you know, this sort of steaming ahead on technology and creating a... A, a sort of superpower status. You know, this is the aspiration of many countries in the world now to really uh, match China and other countries uh, with the, their science and technology capabilities. And Leslie, when you watched Biden, and you've already alluded to it, he was combative. He was uh, trying to give the impression that he's not as old as some might think he is, and he's got what it takes. He's got what it takes for the next two years, and he's got what it takes to stand a, a grueling election campaign and to win. What is your assessment? Does he, and also to what degree might he convince voters that he does? You know, this is a, this is a president who uh, has a relatively low approval rating in the low... 40, 43, 44 percent, despite having delivered a pretty tremendous domestic agenda and hitting his goals, especially at home, but also in foreign policy. And, and to Patricia's point, the, in his, his foreign policy stewardship, not only of the American people, but of America's allies and partners when it comes to supporting Ukraine has, has been very impressive before Russia's invasion. But but does that translate into yeah. to the president getting the kind of support that, that he wishes to get? I think, you know, as with virtually everything in politics, it's going to come down to, you know, who's he up against? This is a president who is very likely to say he's running, very unlikely if he says that to have any serious contenders. He will get that nomination if he if he chooses to put his name. And then the question is, you know, who do the Republicans run? Who do they end up choosing as their candidate? If they choose Donald Trump, I think we see a second term for President Biden. But, you know, the the big questions really at this point, and politics are dynamic, they change very rapidly. But at this point, the big question is not so much about the Democrats, it's about the Republicans. And and you really can't predict, as you all know, what's going to happen uh, in 2024 until we have the answer to, to that specific question. Right. So from a, a raucous Republican caucus to AUKUS, Ewan, in uh, in Singapore, where are we on AUKUS 18, 18 months on? What are we expecting to hear next month when uh, the Australian PM, Anthony um, Albanese, goes, goes to Washington? Give us a, a brief audit on where we are on the whole project. Sure. I, I think we're impatient because it's been a long lead time since AUKUS was announced uh, with great fanfare back in September 2021. Uh, and here we are, and, and still there's no uh, clear uh, indication which way they're going to go. But I, I'll take a punt on that, if you like. Uh, I think the, the, the submarine element of AUKUS is the key for the Australians. That's where the emphasis will be when the decision is made and announced uh, next month. And I think the, if you like, from a UK perspective, the, the pleasant surprise is that I believe the UK will have a very substantive role in the building of that submarine, whereas opinion in Australia, which I track more closely, tended to favour or, or think that this was going to be a, um, predominantly a US-Australia compact and that there might be a face-saving appendage uh, for, for the UK into the bargain. I think it's going to be much deeper than that. And why so? Is that because of the technology of the Brits? Why? Or is this politics to try and draw the Brits in 
more cohesively into the Indo-Pacific because there's a big question here with the British economy tanking, with the short-lived, to put it politely, lived Liz Truss prime ministership and her promises of 3% of defense of GDP spending on defense pretty much disappearing now. The Brits have got to prioritize at some point. They can't be everywhere with the economy of the size that they have. Yes, that's right. I mean, you, you can't argue with geography. The, the UK is not in the Indo-Pacific by any uh, definition, unless you, you count Pitcairn and, and, and Biot, but that, that's, that's a small annex. Uh, I think annex, uh, AUKUS hits both of the key things that, that the UK needs to convince itself uh, both it's an economic opportunity and it's also a uh, you know a, a, a large scale bet in a in a security agreement. It's not an alliance. Uh, it, it's a capability development program, but a very significant one because it's dealing with such exotic and and secret technologies, which which are only shared amongst the, the closest of, of allies. Uh, I think the the big question around AUKUS is the timeline, uh, especially for the Australians. They need the submarines because they have a capability gap. They're worried about deterrence, primarily against China. Uh, but even under the best scenario, those submarines are not going to be delivered until probably the back end of the 2030s. So there's got to be a lot that happens between now and then to, to fill in that, that gap. But I, I, I do think that, uh, I think that despite the understandable skepticism about AUKUS and whether the UK is really going to be uh, strategically in, involved in it, the, the the political rationale for having the UK there is partly as a handmaiden to the United States to deliver nuclear and other uh, high-end defense technologies. But the UK also, I think, is going to be involved in the guts of the program, probably building the back end of the thing, including the, uh, the reactors, based on a, an, a, a modified British submarine design with American combat system and weapons. Fascinating. And briefly, if you would, Ewan, what does Albanese want in Washington? Well, I, I don't think that the Australian Prime Minister, he, he's, not a, he's not a national security natural. Uh, it's not his constituency. I think he's primarily a, a domestic politician. So he's, he's looking for wind in his sails like any politician would be. But I think the, the national interest, the strategic interest of Australia, which was the instigator of AUKUS, after all, uh, is to make sure that he, he does have uh, that high-level commitment from, from President Biden to waive some of the restrictions on, on the uh, sharing of technologies uh, that has been you know, a worry for the, for the U.S. Uh, allies in the region, uh, because unlike the Cold War, the United States can't do it on its own against China, uh, particularly with, with Russia in the mix. It has to be a collaborative effort. And this is a a, a big, bold bet on, on the expansion of, of the allied industrial base. Another critique of it from this region, of course, is it's getting the old Anglo, Anglo gang back together. There is no Asian member of AUKUS, but I, I don't think that's likely to, to change. I think there will be partnerships ahead in the sort of plus AUKUS in the future. But I think that just the, the nature of the difficulty of sharing these very highly compartmentalized and sensitive, sensitive technologies means it has to be amongst the closest of allies to begin with. And Patricia, the head of the IAEA, Raphael Gross, was here at Chatham House this week. You were interviewing him. Let's hear what he had to say. What I need to say is that we are prepared to, to work with these countries. We are aware that uh, for some countries, in particular China, uh, they, they have a different view. They, they see this as a proliferation-prone project. We are saying this is within the legal framework. We're not endorsing anybody's project or any, any, anybody's military objectives or goals. It's not my role. My role is to make sure that is out of this thing there is no proliferation. And in this case, there are three, and there is one that is a non-nuclear weapon state, which is Australia. All right. The, the two others proliferated a long time ago, and they are within the NPT regime, and of course, including Article 6 and the compromise and the commitment to disarm one day. They are, they, their nuclear weapons are part of the landscape. All right. It's not the case for Australia. This is why this is so technically and politically challenging. Uh, we are working 
uh, with the countries. We need to wait until, as you know, there is, uh, uh, they, they set to themselves a period of 18 months until they announce uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, model they will have. It's going to be uh, built in. It's got, will, will it be uh, also partly manufactured in Australia or not or, or, or received? So all of that has a, has a big influence because it, from that it will depend the kind of safeguards approaches and inspection system that we uh, propose. But this is the beginning of, of, of a relatively long I would say, road, and we should not forget that once this special arrangement, if and when the IEA and the three AUKUS partners agree on a special arrangement that would ensure that there is no diversion of nuclear material, then this has to be reported to the Board of Governors of the IEA. Uh, so there is transparency about what is, what is, being, what is being agreed. So, Patricia, he was talking about uh, his proliferation concerns re regarding AUKUS. How, how difficult are these kinds of, of, of submarines to manufacture and, and uh, how does one safeguard on, on this whole question of proliferation? Mm. So this is a really big issue uh, within the nuclear non-proliferation regime uh, where military materials are more or less consigned to those states that have nuclear weapons. Now, Australia doesn't and will not get them and wants to be able to demonstrate that through that whole process of, of verification safeguards that the IAEA can do. And so my understanding is that um, whatever deal gets done, and it looks very likely that the UK, with its really quite strong experience now in building nuclear powered submarines that are not nuclear armed, I think that's really important that, that that's been the case with the UK, that uh, they will be able to do that and that transfer, if you like, will be sealed so that there will be no proliferation risk. And what's really important about that, not only for the AUKUS deal and to reassure everybody within the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but also others that may be developing nuclear powered submarines themselves, and we look, of course, to Brazil, will then have, if you like, a standard that they can aspire to. Now, the Brazilian case will be very different, where they will be developing their own nuclear capability, their own nuclear-powered capability, and again, not nuclear-armed. Uh, and that military, that transfer to the military, uh, which will not be a transfer to weapons, will be a, a new uh, part of the whole management of nuclear materials. So getting this sorted with AUKUS, or at least getting some standards set with AUKUS, is a really important step. And actually, our sense and our analysis is that this may help non-proliferation and prevent proliferation in the longer run. That's fascinating. And Leslie, from an American perspective on, on, the, YO, on the wider geo strategy, when AUKUS was announced 18 months or so ago, big fanfare, big moment for the Australians, the Brits were, were pleased to be involved, and, and, and obviously for Biden, where does it fit into wider US Indo-Pacific strategy? How important is it for the Americans? Oh, it's absolutely essential to the broader strategy in the Indo-Pacific, but it is one part of a, of a much broader strategy. And I, I guess to the earlier comment, you know, the U.S. has always worked through partners and allies. We have the Quad and we also have the Indo-Pacific economic framework, which is, you know, the economic yeah. strategy has been the missing part of the puzzle. But if you think about, you know, the U.S. doesn't use allies because it can't do China on its own. The U.S. has always sought to work with allies and partners on any major national security threat. That's the difference between the U.S. and China. And it's really, you know, been the power of, of the U.S influence for all its flaws has been that it understands that especially now in the it was, you know slow taking this approach in Asia it's certainly caught up now but it understands that you've got to have multiple frameworks for working whether it's on hard security on technology sharing we've seen the US India uh, defense and technology agreement that's recently been announced the big piece of the puzzle that is underdeveloped that, that President Obama had really tried to work on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now the CPTPP and U.S. is not part of it. The U.K. has applied. China wants in. And I think that, that people understand that, you know, 
economic strategy has always been critical to U.S. national security. It was in Europe. It needs to be in Asia. But the domestic situation in the U.S., and especially in the U.S. Congress, so moves against that, makes that so politically uh, difficult to achieve, that it is the weak link in the broader strategy in in the Indo-Pacific. Finally, to a balloon. Patricia, why was it a balloon? Why was it not a satellite or something else? And what on earth was China trying to achieve? Well, it's not an or, it's an and, right? So China has satellites as well, as does the US, as does Russia, as does everybody. And China is sending out balloons all over the place. And this is not the first time that a balloon like this has gone across the US and has gone across the US, according to the OD, DOD, many times uh, during the Trump administration. So why was it such a big moment? Well, yes, exactly. I guess because it was, it was revealed, it was spotted, and people talked about it. It was, it was uh, going over, at the time, it was going over Montana. So these balloons are used for all sorts of things. They're used for weather. Uh, monitoring. They are also used for you know, pollution monitoring, for example, depending on the altitude uh, that they're flying. And they are also used for collecting intelligence. So they have uh, particular qualities. They move slowly. Satellites, of course, pass over quickly and they pass over you know, at, at certain times. This gives a different set of information. So, yes, the question is, why was it such a big deal at this moment? And I guess because it was in the public domain for some reason. And uh, did did they do the right thing to shoot it down? Yes, it's, there's some uncertainty about the who owns that part of aerospace. It's, uh, it's legally ill-defined, as I understand it. I'm not a lawyer, so uh, don't quote me on that. But Bring I think, in the aerospace lawyer. Yeah, we're bringing in the aerospace lawyers. And I know the space lawyers argue about this all the time, you know, where does space start. And so it's uh, shooting it down, getting the uh, equipment, that will upset China for sure. But I mean, it seems fair game, right? I'm pretty sure if something similar happened in China, uh, they would do the same if 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 it was exposed. So, you know, it, let's see what they had on on board. Let's see what they were, what the sensors were, and what they were doing, and that will give a huge amount of information. China won't like that at all. And you, and how did it? Pardon the pun. How did it go down in 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 the region? <laughs> Puns have been irresistible with balloons. They 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 just, have they collocate perfectly. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and resist threat inflation or or, or others to do. Have there been any I, Winnie I, the I Pooh think, um, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not, we're not allowed to use those. I, I agree with much of what Patricia said. I, I, I think the, the the big difference between this and, and satellites is this is a, a clear legal infringement of, of U.S. airspace. And I think that's uh, hard to argue against. I mean, just in the nature of balloons, they, they operate within airspace. That's part of the, the definition. And the slow moving nature of this, I think the the impact is primarily political. Uh, it came, of course, on the cusp of Blinken's planned plan visit, so the timing couldn't be any worse for, for resetting of, of US-China uh, uh, strategic relations. So it, it doesn't make sense that China would do it as a, as a signal. I think rather Patricia's right. This is a program that's been on running. The timing was just deeply unfo- unfortunate, but it, it does reveal that the United, that China, uh, has been doing these things, and it completely calls out the double standard of China's own diplomatic position against U.S. surveillance flights in the South China Sea. The big difference of, between them is that the U.S. operates close, but outside China's airspace. This completely undermines Beijing's position, which I think you saw the the kind of embarrassment in the and the dissonance between the China's MFA reaction and then the subsequent reaction, I think they were they were uh, caught flat-footed. In terms of what it does for the US uh, domestic debate, well, I, I, I defer to, to Leslie on, on that, but I, I think it's very obvious that uh, this visible symbol, tangible symbol of China in a slow-moving state-by-state, day-by-day, with everyone able to see it uh, in a sort of slow-motion violation of US sovereignty is going to do a lot as a watershed for the U.S. public debate, which was already fairly uh, you know, concerned yeah. about China. I think that can, o- can, only, can, only get, um, can only get worse. And so, Leslie, to you, I mean, the Americans did make quite a song and dance about it, as well they might, given what happened. 
but it did scupper Blinken's trip to the region. What was going on in the American political thinking? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I think it's important to remind ourselves that the last thing that was talked about in the U.S. context was whether was the legality of this. This is just not the frame that's used to discuss this in the U.S. This was all about national security, about threat. It was deeply embedded in people's daily reality. And they wanted this balloon shot down. They thought the president was phenomenally weak for not shooting it down earlier, even though he subsequently said that the decision had been made, that he was waiting it to waiting for the balloon to float over water so he could take it down without risking anybody's uh, any any lives being lost, but but it, you know to the to I guess to the couple of things. One is it, it did affect the State of the Union, right? We know, and what I think many people thought was that the the president and his team would rewrite the State of the Union to make take a much harder line in China. In fact, we saw the reverse, because this is a president that does want to cooperate with China, that does want to invest in a very serious way in diplomacy, and the last thing that he needed to do was to take a very hard public position and one that's now very firmly embedded in Congress with the Republicans there and then with the balloon and inflate that threat. So in fact, what he did was to say very little about China. And he did talk about cooperating with China where we have common interests were his were his words. Um, That decision to postpone but not cancel Blinken's trip, I think, is a critical one. Uh, And and the other thing that's come up is that, you know, the timing of the balloon, some people think that that China Uh, set off this balloon just on the back of the agreement between the Netherlands, Japan, and the U.S. to align on export controls of semiconductor chips to China. So, you know, the timing isn't necessarily random. You know, once again, this is a president who understands how quickly the American electorate could mobilize around an anti-China agenda, and he's trying to manage it. Patricia, last word to you. A a balloon is... A, a thing, it's a symbol that is incredibly tangible that ordinary voters can relate to. When you're talking about other weaponry or other pieces of surveillance, incredibly high tech, they're sort of beyond the ken of, of a lot of people. But a balloon floating above your airspace, above your country is incredibly tangible. What do you think that does to the whole debate around surveillance but between the big powers yes and and in fact other types of surveillance such as blimps you know the 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 the, the sort of zeppelins that we we can uh, see monitoring our football crowds for example mm-hmm. they've also been looked at in in terms of uh, spying in terms of intel gathering and and arms control monitoring i i think i'd just like to end thinking about what's going on in china here because, as you say, the MFA was somewhat uh, wrong-footed. We've seen that before. Uh, we've seen uh, major mistakes being made over the whole COVID, zero COVID policy, then the opening up and the really devastating uh, impacts of that. And whether or not we, because I think we often imagine that you know China, the Chinese government controls everything. And I think what we're seeing here are the cracks below that surface. And we ought to be thinking a lot more about that and what that means for our relationships with China. That was a packed programme, everybody. Thank you very much for your contributions to our guests down the line, Ewan Graham from the IISS and from my colleagues here at Chatham House, Leslie and Patricia. Their work, their research and that of all our colleagues can be found here at Chatham House on our website. A reminder, you can find all of our podcasts are at the usual places, Apple, Spotify, and all major podcast providers, as well as through our social media channels. So do please like, follow, and subscribe. Uh, Do leave us a review as they help with our profile. You can read more from our experts, find out more from our events, or you can become a member. Don't forget to visit our website, chathamhouse.org. This week, you heard from the head of the IAEA, Rafael Grossi, who was interviewed by Patricia. And you can hear the full event and clips available on YouTube and across our social media. That's all from us for now. For me, that's my last Chatham House outing on this podcast, at least in in this incarnation. I'll leave the others to Bronwyn and all our colleagues. Thank you very much for listening. (laughs) 